Yeah. Now I have uh, to my left a uh, dear friend, uh, somebody I do, who, who going to say, I, I think we know a little bit, he knows a little bit about uh, Paul Bolt. And, but first of all, we would like to extend our most sincere words of appreciation for the Olympic champion and her coach to be here. This is uh, unique and uh, come uh, together with our coaches community to share with you the experience. So don't be shy, ask questions. And so I, like I said, next to me, it's a dear friend. He was past president of the development department uh, commission where uh, our coaches commission was part of it and uh, <coughs> uh, he doesn't need any introduction just a great person a fantastic athlete and still a dear friend i believe a lot in the coach so sejebuka so he will be moderating this section and seje so it's my pleasure to welcome you, and thank you for being here with us, okay? Victor, thank you very much. First of all, I think it would be great from my side also congratulate Katerini and Mitchell for, for great results, what they, they show last year in Rio de Janeiro, and also, of course, World Championships title just Two days ago, it was a very exciting com competition. This is really fantastic to see how the coach and athlete work together, how they keep stability. Sometime after the Olympic season, you can choose more calmer competition, but Katerini showed fantastic results for, for 91. Congratulations, and of course, we wish you all the best because this is so important. And of course, we are pleased that you're performing in such a high, high level. Today, you will get opportunity to ask them questions, to, to share. This is really important and great that such a conference has happened uh, during the championships. You will get the opportunity to build up and to learn your successful future. For that, for me, it's great honor to be with you. It's pleased that it's short conference when, when I was the chairman of development, we already start this because we believe in role of the coaches. For me always, it's important because always we highlight the champions, we highlight stars. In most cases, we, we, we forget about the coaches. But I would like to say they never start shiny, never sparking if we don't have coaches work behind and they work together. For me, the athletes are our heroes, they are our stars, but our coaches is our treasure because they're building stars. They're working many years, they, they're learning. They do so, you, you can do mistakes, but you learn from your mistakes and best way what is today, better to learn from mistakes of others and not repeat the same mistakes. For that, it's conferences like this is very, very important. Regarding the role of the coaches, for me, it's always it's big and important. And also, I hope you, you, you follow the situation and you saw that the International Olympic Committee decided in November it will be the first time given a word for lifetime coach achievement. It will be one award for, for women, one award for, for, for men coaches. And this is, will be done by President Thomas Bach. Uh, I'm chairman of uh, IUC Entourage Athletes Commission. And we propose to executive board to make this award because this is very important. The key elements, this is the coaches. And we did uh, analysis and we did research in International Olympic Committee how link between coach and athlete. Where athletes receive most information to whom he go to address and receive response. 83% of the athletes, they link 
to the coaches. They will get information from the coaches. For that, your level of knowledge, your professional knowledge, is so important for success of your career and, of course, success of your athlete. For that, it's, I, I would say that it's really a great and important conference today. And I think we will get a lot of uh, opportunity to, to exchange. And I think we can proceed to the, 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 to the next point. Günther, how, how you plan to, 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 to do? Questions and answers or? Please. The strength of this conference is the question of the coaches. Use this opportunity and please ask your question. Introduce you by name and address whom you want you to answer that question. On your marks, go. Starting here from the left. Hi, my name is Sky from Singapore. I'm a coach myself. Uh, just want to check with you. How did you get into pole vault and how did you uh, carry on for so many years? I, I started when I was 10 years old. It was 2000 when uh, the women's pole vault was in the Olympics for the first time. I watched the Olympics. My, both my parents did track and field. My dad triple jumped and my mom did the 400 meters. Uh, so I, I was in track and field from a younger age than 10, but at 10, I decided I really liked what I saw in Sydney, and that's kind of how I started. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, my name is Pat Itani from Nigeria. My question is, how long have you been with your coach? Um, I met my coach actually five years ago now. Uh, we were teammates first. We had a different coach. Uh, we were teammates for two, two or three, three years, and then he has been my coach for the last two years. Hello, I'm Charles McConnell. I'm an endurance coach from Great Britain. Could you explain your thinking at the end of a competition if you're tied for first place and there's only two people left in and you fail your first attempt at 490 and your opponent clears 490, why do you almost inevitably go up to 495? Why don't you take your two extra jumps at 490 so you have three attempts at 495? Uh, to, to you. Well, it, everyone really. <laughs> <laughs> well, at a championship, I would say that I, if there's only two people left, I will go up to the next height because I'm trying to win. Because even if my opponent made 490 and I missed, now I'm not tied for first anymore. I'm second, so I'm going up to the next height where I can go back to being first. But I think that's a personal thing. For me, I can only take so many jumps at a big championship, so I don't want to waste energy trying to jump a 490 and then go to the next height. But for somebody else who <clears throat> might be getting better by taking more jumps, maybe they will choose to take the extra two attempts at 490 and then move up. But to me, that wouldn't make too much sense, especially at a championship. So, I, I don't know if you guys agree. <laughs> So at, at, the, at the end of the competition, your f entire focus is on gambling, that just because you failed at 490, you are confident that you can make 495. I, th I think if I, if I get the right jump that will make 490, it's quite possible that it might also make 495. So it almost seems like a waste to take a jump that might make 490 instead of trying the next height. I would like to add to this. Um, if you've noticed in the last two championships that she's competed, she didn't put herself into this position. Um, and this is mentally preparing for the championship. Sorry, I'm not a public speaker, so this is difficult for me. Um, but we mentally prepare going in. We know what bars need to be made on a first attempt. And this is what we're going after. Not a certain high height. We knew kind of where Sandy was. We've watched her all year. So we knew what she needed to make win in order to take the lead. Same in Rio. Um, so you go in preparing to make these first attempts to put yourself in a position not to make decisions like that. Can I add to, to some comments? Because if 
you have your opponent and you missed first attempt and someone is clear. But it's like for Caterini, it's don't need to go to the second and third to have second or third place. If she wants to win, it's better to move on five centimeters. It's basically the height is the same, but the mental preparation is totally different. First, you have time to analyze what you did wrong. Second, you have time to prepare for next attempt. You recovering what is very important, but because on, on, on the top level, when you go for, for the medal, you may be one or two athletes. It means you don't have time for recovery. Better to have break, to reanalyze, to reconcentrate, and five centimeters is not big difference. But when you jump in for winning or just to save the height to be second or third, and after you get three attempts, these three attempts maybe will never happen. But when you go for victory, even you have two attempts, it doesn't matter, even one attempt, is much better mental power and hunger to win than just to be second, third, or fifth, or seventh. This is mentally is very, very important. Hi, uh, sorry, Lauren from the Bahamas. So you talked about your mental, being mentally prepared for the event. Could you talk a little bit about your between jump um, mental preparation or if you have like a between jump routine or pre-performance routine? I, I would say I'm a very chatty athlete in, in the field. Uh, I try to talk to my competitors, especially the ones I know that they're OK with talking and I'm not distracting them. And I think that way I'm distracting myself a little bit and not getting so nervous. But once the competition starts and I have to start focusing, I think I do a pretty good job of just only thinking about myself and my pole. I actually try not to watch the other athletes jump. I think that has been a very important change we've made the last couple of years because it used to affect me when I see somebody make a lower height by a big margin. That would affect me for the next bar, so I don't watch them anymore. Uh, but I, I would say that's something I had growing up. I learned to be really good at focusing because I had only 30 minutes to study for school every day. So I had to do really good at those 30 minutes. And I think I'm that way in pole vault. I can be chit chatting and just laughing. And a second later, the second I step on the runway, I can concentrate to what I have to do. Uh, David Charlton from the Bahamas, also coach. Now, um, in your inter in the introduction earlier, I think you you were also a World Juniors champion. Um, I was a World Youth champion. I was third at World Juniors. Okay. Very, very good. Yeah. Um, what would you say helped you to transition from a World Youth champion to now a World uh, uh, um, Senior champion? You know, it was not an easy transition. I had a lot of very mediocre years. Uh, but I think I was a little lucky. I got a scholarship from the US. I went to the US and studied in a college there. And I think that very difficult point between junior and being at a good age to compete against the best in the world uh, at a senior level, uh, I was in college. So even though I was not jumping so high, I, I ended my college career with 448, which is OK. Uh, I was still at a very competitive environment, and I was still one of the best in that environment. So I think that kept me, well, first of all, it kept me into the sport, very important. And second of all, it kept me into that competition mentality where you're going to a championship and you're trying to win a championship. Uh, so I think that helped a little bit the transition from the junior level to the senior level. Hi, Sam Dodge. Over. Oh, you're good. Don't cover it. Okay. I'm Ibrahim Hussein from Kenya, and in pole vault, I think we are in nursery school. We are not the best pole vaulters. <laughs> uh, but my question is to Sergey, when he, of the, or the coach, how much preparation do you prepare to compete in a high level? How much preparation do you need? And uh, 
The second question is, do you see pole vault in sub-Saharan Africa apart from South Africa? In Kenya, we have only three landing mats for pole vaults. What's your advice? Thank you. Um, I think preparation is dependent on the athlete very much. Um, when I got Katerina, I was lucky enough that she had a technical base that I was comfortable with. We both came from the same background, I would say. Um, there were changes that I obviously wanted to make. Um, but the biggest difference, and I think it comes back to the question about how you transition from a junior and a youth to a real champion, is the mental. She came from a European atmosphere. Um, which I think is amazing in some ways and lacks in some ways. And the same with the US. I think it's amazing in some ways and lacks in some ways. And I think we could bring the balance. Um, so to put those two together was more what we worked on. So I, there's no answer on how much you train. Um, for us, we're training more mental and how we prepare for meets and how I structure the programming to get her mentally prepared. Um, maybe we're not training as hard as other athletes to get as big percentage gains in strength and speed by the end of the season. Instead, I'm letting her compete at a higher level earlier in the season so that she can stay confident during the season. And we go to the championship and she knows which corrections we're comfortable with and what she can jump when we get there. So we lose a little percentage gain and gain confidence and stay consistent, which has proved to be a good method. As far as <laughs> getting pole vault to your region, um, I think this is difficult. It's, a, it's an event, I think, that has a lot of technical aspect. So I'm not sure what coaches you have there with the knowledge of the technique there. Maybe bringing in coaches to begin would be the best method. <laughs> Um, in the U.S., there's some academies, I think, like IMG, who first bring in good coaches and then athletes want to go. And then there's some that just want athletes because they have a great facility, which is not the way to go about it. Um, so I think maybe you have to start first by finding a knowledgeable coach, and athletes will come from that. It, it may be, uh, Sergey, we have, we have some of the best gymnasts. If you come and see some agropart. Is that the type of a body we are looking for? Because if you come to some of our clubs in Kenya, we have these acrobats who are very good. And uh, they are so flexible. I know it's a different uh, way of doing it. Them, I think it will be if they're able to run well. <laughs> because normally gymnast is not running well. <laughs> they can do a lot of great things. You're absolutely right. It's pole vault, it's two sports straight. It's on the ground, it's athletics. In the air, it's gymnastic. And of course, most important what uh, Mitchell mentioned, it's, it's of course quality of the coaches. First, you need to have coaches who knows how to develop pole vault. When you said, to be on the top level, how much, I don't know, preparation you need. I can tell you I start when I was 10, like uh, Katerini, but it takes me nine years when I become the world champion. I was 19. It's, 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 it's quite well and successful, but these nine years, it was, I would say, incredible job. And of course, this is great job of my coach. Of course, for coach, it's important to have talent which you can develop and put the skills and your knowledge to the athletes to see the, the results later. But it's, of course, everything when the small kid come, that's coming from the coach. And you have different period when you go up and down. But the, the most important, if you start with the kids, it doesn't matter pole vault or something else, any other the, the discipline or events of track and field. You, you cannot do in 13, 14, 15 years old kid what you can do after 18 years old, in 20, 21, 22. Because when, when you grow, the kids grow, the bone joints and everything, you cannot put overload training 
just to be successful in youth world championships or to be the best in, in the junior world championships. Priority and strategy for the coach must be a senior sport. If you develop the kit and you know exactly what you need in age of 13, what kind of program should be, 14, 15, 16, this is very important. You will get the future. But if you overload and you push a lot, you can be successful in the young age, but there's no future afterwards. It will be no transition period. This can be the maximum. I was lucky because my coach was smart, intelligent, and very well educated. And he saw talent in, in me, but he said to me, I remember very well when I was 14, 15, because I left the family for athletics in the age of 15. Moved to another city, I live in the dormitory of the workers, I go to school myself, I cook and everything, but this everything my coach teach me. And he took responsibility from the family to organize my life, and I follow his advice. But he always said to me, we will not rush in 15 years for youth or for junior. If naturally what we need to do in this age, you will perform well and you will be the leader, it's fine. But the, our goal, senior sport. And he was clear, said, we will come to the top in age of 20, but we will come for a long time. And it's practically, if you look to my career, it, it, it's happened. Regarding the, 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 the coach, uh, you, 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 your athlete on your beautiful continent because you have a lot of talents. But without knowledgeable coaches who can stay and organize the training and also to teach other coaches to understand methodology, technique, you need to have poles, you need to have landing area. This is a very long process because sometimes as many athletes you have talent in, in, in your continent. It's easy maybe to be sprinter, to be 200, 400, or middle distance. But for pole vault, you need, I don't know, eight, 10 years. But this is a long time when you need to invest. And it's sometimes it's like, you know that we, we, we have a center in Formia where is my coach works, Vitaly Petrov. What was the philosophy and importance in my understanding, and Vitaly shared this, when you send some athlete to some center, how long athletes can stay there? One month, two months, three months? Because you need to cover the cost. When athletes coming back, the home coach is not on the same pace, not the same level. And for me, this is like we waste the money. My philosophy was if we send athlete to the center, practically in pole vault. We must be also personal coach together. In this case, investment, what we did, it's in, and knowledge will be transferred to the athlete and to the coach. And this coach from home can grow, can understand what is technique, what is method, methodology, what kind of exercises is chosen. And after they go, they can go back home. They can work two, three months, for, for program what was preparing for them. After some months they come back, the, the top coach can see, guide, assist, prepare them for, for, for the next step. For me it's, it's very, very important, the knowledge of the coaches. How to pass the knowledge, this, this is the key. And you, 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 you can see development. For us, as I said, the coach is the treasure and we should keep I and work closely with the, the most prominent, most I would say outstanding successful coaches who can share for coaches all the f philosophy, all the knowledge and experience. In this case, we will get new generation, new talents, new champion, because your job is so, so important. For that, for your continent, it must be developed special program how to, to develop, because you have so many great talents. But of course, you must be patient and you must invest. So Katerina and Mitch, um, you had a great coach at Stanford, Nick Heisong. Um, how would you describe the benefits of his approach to coaching versus the current approach to coaching? 
I was actually coached by Toby Stevenson in college. I was coached by Nick Heisong afterwards. Okay. Uh, and actually, Mitch Mitchell was also a Nick's athlete as well. Uh, the, I, I would say that this is the difference uh, between what I will call, for lack of a better word, the European versus the American approach. Uh, with Nick, we did very much running. In fact, we ran 300 at some point in the season, which I ran 30 meters in my approach. And there is a point in the season where we do do a little bit more cardio, but to sprint the 300 for me, I think is almost useless. Um, and we, we did a lot of lifting, and it was all right. What the, the exercises we were doing were okay, but he, Nick was so focused on how much weight I'm lifting instead of my positions or how fast I'm moving the weight, how explosive I'm being with it, that it seemed to be almost counterproductive. And while I had a good career with Nick and I PR'd, I went from a 450 pole vaulter to a four, I think I left him with a 477. Uh, best. I had a lot of injuries with Nick, and I, I mean, of course, it's, I'm not saying it's necessarily his program. I was also getting older, uh, but I, I do think a little bit is I came from a very European uh, perspective in, of training, where quality is much more important than quantity, and I was thrown into quantity, and I did not have the base for it. So I think I got a lot more injured than other athletes doing the same things. Versus with with meets, we have focused back a lot on quality. We do a lot more drill-based training, and this, and of course we still do speed and and lifting, but everything is focused on me being a better pole vaulter. And I think maybe Nick made me a better athlete overall. I I would say, but. At the end of the day, my goal is to pole vault higher, not to squat higher or to bench more. Uh, so I, I think maybe we lost focus a little bit there. And with Mitch, we focus a lot more on, um, like, if I'm doing a snatch, I am focusing on how fast I move the weight, how explosive. I, this is an explosive event we do. So I don't care so much about how heavy I'm lifting, but I care about speed in those exercises. And the same with our speed training. I. I have run one 300 this whole season, and with Nick, we probably ran like 12 a week. So it's it's very, very different. But I have been a lot healthier the last couple of years, and even healthier this year than last year. Um, oh, and, and the one thing, and I don't know if you want to add anything, but we have we have switched a lot of our focus from lifting. I would say I probably lift once a week, and we do a lot more plyos, which is it's still hard on the body. It's just, I think it's probably as beneficial and even more uh, than lifting, and I think it transfers a lot better to our event. I don't know. Sorry, I'm Antonio Latorre, a long distance coach. I'm very curious to know the, the data of analysis of women pole vault final preliminary result and biomechanics uh, element. And I require the comments for the coach and also of Sergei. Thanks. OK, so we had an analysis done with a 3D motion an analysis at 200 frames per second. Um, as you can see, of the 12 athletes in the final, Katarina was the only one to have a better performance than her season best, which I think stands to the point of brain training um, and preparing her confidence. I think a lot of the girls came in faster than I saw them all year, but what did they do with it? Uh, I think the results show. Um, anything on this slide, Sergey? No, I think you're the expert. You are on the practical field. For me, it's very difficult to to comment right now. Um, as far as this slide, I think this is a very interesting thing, and it's something I argue with many people about quite often. Um, speed is not everything in the pole vault. And it is very important and very useful. But like I said, we back off of strength training in order to become confident. So as you can see here, Katarina is the third fastest. 
but jumping significantly higher. Um, and of course, this has to do with contact time on the ground. I think we're changing direction. We're going for a little different approach. Pole vault is a system of energy, and we can't just have one piece of the system far greater than the other. It has to transfer over the whole system. So for me, speed is not everything. And in, I don't know how the other events are. I can't speak to that. But in pole vault, I think we get caught up, especially in the US, with too much speed. We have to have speed in the right directions. And you'll see in some later um, pages what I mean by this. Sorry, can, I, can I add something to this? Because I've done a, a, this analysis before. Uh, if you see the second to last column where it says contact time to take off, it's how fast I got off the ground at the very end. And you can see that uh, me and Yarislay Silva, who, if you've seen jump, sees extremely um, good at plyometrics. It jumps very high. And I think that contact to time, which for both me and Silva, it's a little longer. I think it almost correlates with power to the ground. So we're staying on the ground a little longer, but we're actually using the ground and jumping up. And I think that's something a lot of pole vaulters forget about. There is a vertical component to the vault. We, we want to run fast, but we, we want to run fast this way to go as high as we can. And I think a, a lot of vaulters forget that at the end of the day, we need to go up, and we need to jump up, and we need to help the ball. And I think this shows in that column the contact time to take off at takeoff. Now, I just want to add what said Katerina. It, it's a very important point that you need to vault. <laughs> but the most, they're not vaulting. They're standing on the ground, and they're bending the pole. For that, all your velocity, all your energy, it's wasted. It's go to the box, but it's not give you back any energy through the pole to the body to fly. You need to have good velocity. But the question how you transfer all this energy, all the velocity to the pole, in the case, as coach said, it's maybe Katerina on the third position on velocity, but how she transform all the energy to the pole and she jump she do take off and push the pole to move. This is what we talk, this is the key of pole vault. Why in pole vault you see more or less the athletes on the same level, but you don't see the gap is, is if we speak about the men pole vault six or the girls five and higher, in, in, in men pole vault six and higher. But because still 32 years later, six meter, this is the best. You win everything. It means this is technique. It's so important. This is the key of success. Regarding the, the, the preparation, because of course you must be mentally, physically prepared very well to achieve good technique. This is connected. But in connection, I want to say before, when you're preparing, you look to choose different exercises. You do weightlifting, you do gymnastic, you do the sprint, you do the jumps, high jump, long jump, hurdles for it, and the different things. But in all this training, you need to do a lot of repetition. It means athletes receive very hard, big amount of training. And in this way, I just want also to, to focus for you to say the, it's culture of every exercise, right technique of every exercise, very important. This is, will help you get efficiency and better results, and also the safe health of the athlete. Because you have responsibility. It, it's huge responsibility on coach to prepare to be successful, and also you're responsible about the future. If it's what will be the health of the athlete, what will be with the, the back, what will, will be with the ankle, I don't want to see in 20, 30 years as you suffer from that. For that, it's, I would say it's culture of movement for every exercise is very important. And a lot of knowledge and information you can share between each other. But practically what I remember, it's, it's in many cases it's very difficult in same event to get open discussion maybe between coaches. But regarding how to improve the, 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 the speed, how to be better in weightlifting, or how to, to make better jumps. You can learn from others. 
if you, maybe Paul Voltis will not share with you, but you can learn from high jump coach, from sprint coach, you can discuss with gymnast coach, you can discuss with weightlifting coaches. You can find a lot of knowledge what is around you. But the question, if you want to digest, if you want to get that, this is why it's such a conference. It's, this is so important. And it's great to see such a big interest as today and the days before. And to listen from the, the, the champions, this is the, the best information what you can get. Uh, uh, my name is Henny, a uh, sprint coach from South Africa. Question for Coach Mitch. Uh, since you made a comment uh, of uh, what is good and what's lacking in the States and, and Europe, some information uh, came forward. Can you expand a little bit more what you see is, is good and lacking in States and in Europe? Um, this is a little touchy. Um, <laughs> in Europe, in Greece, anywhere where we spend most of our time, I can walk into the stadium on any given day, and it's like Sergey has said, everybody is working on brilliant technique. We can walk into the stadium and see 10 kids having, I believe there is a good, perfect model for pole vault. I think that not everybody can have the same model, and we have to adapt to the child a little bit. Um, that being said, everybody has a very similar technique, and people are doing things the same, and they're working on drills, 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 and this allows them to perform consistently. Um, but as far as the strength training goes, um, I think maybe there needs to be a little bit more of it and a, a little more thought out process of it. Um, and then when we go to the US, I have been to thousands of clubs and camps where kids are doing nothing but pole vaulting. They didn't learn how to carry a pole. They didn't learn how to hold a pole. They didn't learn how to walk, really. And then we're trying to pole vault. And I think you see it in the consistency. There's tons of talent in the States, and there's tons of interest in pole vault. But we consistently fall short. Um, and I think we work too much on speed. Everybody thinks that it is a factor of speed, obviously. Um, but we have to be able to translate that speed, like he said. And I think the lack of drilling there and the lack of focus and. Thank you. Hi, Jerry. I I absolutely know nothing about pole vault, but I really like to watch it. I coach race walkers. Um, but uh, Katharina, you said something, or you tweeted something, uh, that really caught my attention after the uh, uh, after your event, and it was right after your interview. And you tweeted, "I'm not sure what goes through my mind during interviews." <laughs> you gave a great interview. Um, it was it was really wonderful, but that that comment that you made that you're not sure what goes through your mind during interviews sort of tells me that you're you're tapping into some part of your your unconscious mind as well when you're performing. So I'm wondering, are you doing any work on flow or or the type of mind work that you're doing? Does it go to that place where you where you can tap that uh, unconscious resource that you have? I mean, I can talk about the unconscious. It's called the unconscious for a reason. But one thing that once we started working together, so let me first say that I study psychology in college. Well, I studied biology, and then I went into grad school. I got my master's in psychology. But when we first met, I was very against sports psychology. I think maybe because I saw how research was conducted, and to me, it just didn't seem applicable to to what I would call the real world, and psychologists might kill me when I say that. Um, but it, it's very different to have an experiment in a very controlled situation in a room, and very different what happens out there in the field. But he, he made me start doing a lot of visualization. Uh, it was very difficult for me at the beginning. I've done this now for 17 years, and I cannot visualize myself pole vault. I mean, I have to have taken now. I, millions of jumps and I could not I was not able to visualize myself pole vault. So we started very slowly by maybe visualizing the first step and the second step and at first I had to visualize myself from a third person perspective. So as 
as I'm looking at myself and not I'm actually doing it. And then slowly over the years, now I can say that maybe I've reached the point where I can see myself taking the jump from my perspective. It has been very dif difficult, but I think it's just as important as physical training. I think, I think a lot of people know what to do for physical training, even if you're not doing 100% the right things, you're close enough. As long as you're healthy, you can compete at a pretty high level if you're talented and you've done good work. But I think a lot of people forget about that part. They forget about the men, well, it happens to be the topic today too, but they forget about the mental part. And that is something that Mitch really pushed me towards. But I think more to what you're saying about the unconscious, I think comes from the way um, my coach talks to me. And I think that's that's very important. I, I don't know if you want to talk more about it. The, <clears throat> um, as far as she's saying how I talk to her, everything, I was very hesitant to have her here in the first place because I think our athletes are listening to everything we say. We're their mentors. So they're taking it in, they're analyzing it, they're reviewing it, and it stays with them. So for me, I've seen far too often coaches are saying things, maybe it's in the bus or the coffee shop or even on the field, things that Athletes can't do anything with. Um, if we want them to make a change and we, for instance, if I want her to move her hands at takeoff and I tell her, don't move, your, you didn't move your hands, is that giving her any instruction or is that just telling her what she didn't do? So now she has to take that, process what I meant, and then her brain's going to go the extra mile because she is intelligent and say, well, why didn't I move my hands? Am I not running? Am I not doing this? Am I not? So we've put our athlete into a slump already. So for me, we have to give the athlete direct orders. And I am not a believer in letting them know what they're doing wrong. Um, I don't think we should lie to them. They're not stupid. If we all continuously tell them everything's great, they're going to know we're lying and they're going to stop trusting us. But what we can do is find something in the system of the vault to tell them that they're doing good with and then give them a correction of something that they're doing bad with. So the good distracts them from something they didn't like. And then we give them a correction to focus on. And that's it. And then maybe at the end of the season, we talk about, OK, here's what I want to work on more. Here's what I think the vault is what's going to improve your vault for next year. Uh, Est-ce que je pourrais poser une question en français? C'est bon. Euh, Monsieur Sergei, je voudrais vous poser une question. On a parlé tout à l'heure de l'importance du mental sur la performance. Quand vous avez dominé la perche sur le plan mondial, quel était votre état d'esprit en abordant un championnat C'est-à-dire, aviez-vous des certitudes ou alors des doutes Je répète la question. Voilà. On a, dans la première partie, on avait parlé de l'importance du mental sur la performance. Donc, je voulais savoir, M. Sergei, quand vous avez dominé la perche sur le plan mondial, quand vous abordiez un championnat, est-ce que vous aviez des certitudes vis-à-vis -vis de vos adversaires ou alors des doutes ou quel était votre état d'esprit I would say it's every championships, uh, it's different. It's like every day is different. You need to find the puzzle to put yourself in, 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 in good condition, in, in, in mental preparation. Of course, when you already achieve some results, some performances, you already have experience and you know how to link inside your head everything. But of course, sometimes you, you're confident, it's, you, it's preparation is going very well. You train well, you do very good jumps. You're confident and you come into the competition to, to set up the new world record. Sometimes, if practically, I can say, 
1997, when I won my last championships, they, I was not confident, I was not ready, I was in bad shape because I had uh, surgery just eight months before. Three months I didn't run at all. After three months surgery, I just make jogging. First 400 meters is not jogging. After six months, I still have pain. I couldn't do normal training to be fit. If you're not physically in good shape, you're not technically able to do something. I came to the championship with results 5 meters 60. For me, until last minute was this situation when I need to decide, or I go or not. Because basically, I was not ready. But of course, I want to, to, to compete and to be in the championships. In that time, because regarding the mental part, the mental part, you as coach, you can help until certain level. You have certain knowledge. I can say practically. And after my coach tried to find professionals who can help to build next levels. For that, we, we had some psychologists who helped me in my career. And I phoned to him and I asked his advice, what do you think? Because I feel I'm getting better every day. But I don't know if I reach good results in the championships or not. Do I go or not? And he said to me, you should go. But when you go to competition, try to be mentally in the best shape when you compete, when everything was really good. Try to go in this, how to say, environment, to put in your mind that environment, to find the confidence, to find that everything is well, because you need positive support. You must be confident. Otherwise, it's very difficult to succeed it. And second thing is for me, it's, it's like, you know, it's always something can happen. The, the atmosphere or comment of my opponents, this has always helped me. And in that time, when it's, it's Maxim Tarasov, just maybe two weeks before, I did 560 in competition. It was my best uh, performance before the championships. <clears throat> Maxim said that I need to retire. It's my time is past. It's over. And Sergei doesn't have enough, enough strength to retire. I thought, regarding my career, it's my decision. If I want to continue, I continue. If I want to retire, I retire. But it's he, 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 he created trouble for himself. He gave me incredible motivation. As I told you, I was not ready, but I standing up from the knee to tell him I am still alive. And what I did in, in Athens, 6 one this is, was mission impossible. <laughs> I was not ready on everything, technically, physically, mentally. But I just want to prove it. And this is, was incredible, most difficult competition. And I clear 601. If I watch today 601 there, even for me, difficult to believe this is 601. Because it was, looks like 550. <laughs> It was 50 centimeters above the bar. I would say maybe that one was the best. I, I would not say technically the best world, but it was the highest world what I did in my career. If it was because it was Japanese measure when I clear 595 in world championships in Tokyo, they said it was uh, 637. One year later, when I did 613 world record in Japan, they said 634. I don't know if someone measures 601, but I think it's 640, maybe more. <laughs> but this is, I'm very thankful always for my opponent and very thankful for Maxim because he gave me incredible motivation and I become six time world champion at that time. Thank you. Question for Mitch. Um, Mitch, I was very interested to hear your approach and your approach to coaching. Um, I know you're a vaulter before, but you you were talking in sort of NLP language and things like that. What's your background? Do you, how did you come about your philosophy? Um, why did you take this particular approach? It seems very uh, broad thinking. 
Um, I think I read somewhere, maybe Dan Path used something around the terminology of a knowledge leech. Um, I have always been somebody that I will go stand by the smartest people I think are in the room and I will not say a word. Um, and I will just leech as much knowledge as I can. And I think that the more that I go and I try to have a conversation, once I give my opinion, it limits what they will say. Um, and I would prefer that they tell me everything they're going to say, and then I can take it and put it in my mind um, and use it how I want. But I would say the biggest impact in my life was uh, Nick Haisung's father actually coached me. and. He turned my philosophy of sport and life around. Um, and I would say everything is started with him and the way he coached and the way he talked to athletes. And maybe this came later because Nick said he was pretty harsh on him and different. Um, but with me, I loved him. Um, so I think he turned it around. And then I wanted to see more and learn more. And I look at other events. I played baseball for 16 years. And so I took a lot of baseball coaching and from everywhere. Yes, uh, my name is Oscar Gade, a member of the Coaches Commission. It's a question of, uh, to Neil. Considering the level of Ekaterina and her wonderful process, how will you help, how will you interact with, with the team, athlete, coach, in order to, to support and to help them to, to go even higher? In which way, how, which, which is the, the strategy you will like to, to, to help and to share with them? Uh, well, I'm not a pole vault coach and I know very little about pole vault. Uh, and my area is on enhancing endurance performance. Yeah, but I mean, so, if perhaps you can help them from the, the everything you mentioned in, in, in your presentations, how, which will be the strategy, how can you interact with them? Well. I'd have to find out how much of an aer aerobic component their training has. Uh, none. So, so, but, but we saw yesterday about how the sprinters train aerobically upper body. So if there is some aerobic component, then maybe you could use some of the techniques I, I talked about into your training. But there is an, an area of research on uh, doing dual tasks for skill acquisition. I don't know it very well, but there's potential that you know, doing a, a, a dual task whilst predominantly learning the main skill, maybe that would, would be able to help. But yeah, I, I don't think I could give anything directly if, if they had, even though the act of running with a pole vault is highly, you know, doesn't have much of an aerobic component, if they had aerobic component in their training, then maybe it could enhance, enhance air. So it'd be, it sounds like it'd be very limited how the techniques I presented could, could actually help. But, but you never know. I mean, we saw in my presentation that mental fatigue has been shown to impair sport-specific skills. So if a more research was done in that area and it was shown to impair pole vault skills, potentially, then maybe building resilience to that mental fatigue could have an improvement. But at the moment, this area of which I present is very new. So it's, it's very hard to say how it could help or in the future how, how much it could help. To kind of take it back to his if that's what you're looking for. Um, as far as mental fatigue, I think decisions as coaches, we can take some of this away. Um, maybe not with a task, but maybe with decisions we make. For Katarina, I know that mental fatigue in a con competition is a component of time. Um, so often we start high, um, and this is not just to start high, this is because I know that once she takes the first jump, she's going to go back and be analyzing that jump over and over in her head until she takes her second jump. So for me, it's better to jump higher. And even if she misses the bar, we can take another jump, but not sit there for the whole competition to progress and think about what she has to change and then try to take another jump. Um, so there's a little bit on mental fatigue there and how we can adjust it as coaches. Uh, hi, my name is Tomasz and I come from Slovenia. I'm an endurance coach. Uh, 
First of all, I want to thank for organizing this. I'm learning a lot. I have no clue about pole vault. Uh, my question is, uh, you were talking about specificity. So when you train for speed, do you, do you train running with a pole uh, maximum speed in the training as well without putting the wall into the hole? And the, question, the second question is, uh, what uh, factor is a fear in your discipline? Whereas I think you must have some awareness that uh, what you're doing is quite dangerous. So does the, the fear factor changes also during the competition as you, as you progress through heights? Or, um, yeah, I would like uh, the, the answer from both of you. Thanks. OK, as far as... <laughs> Conditioning speed. Um, yes, I'm a believer that we need to do a lot of speed training with a pole. For me, Katarina could run better without a pole. Um, she runs much better when she has a pole in her hand, so I don't want to practice the other way. Um, so yes, we do a lot of speed training with the pole. I mean, like I said, I've done this since I was 10, and I never, even though I, I did, I competed in track before that age, I never uh, trained for any, I, I did a little bit of sprinting and long jump, but I never trained for it, so I have grown up with a pole in my hands, and I feel more comfortable running with a pole in my hands. We, of course, do some stuff without a pole, we can always have a pole in our hands, but it's it's different running position almost when you're running with a pole. You want to be taller. You, you, you're not quite, I mean, you're sprinting in terms of velocity, but you're sprinting in quite a bit different position. So we do a lot of things with the pole. Not always putting it in the box, but maybe having a towel down. Some people put a box, like a plastic box that uh, slides. Um, so there's different things, even just a line, just a chalk line. I mean, there's a lot of different options. and. I mean, in terms of the fear, I I have said I'm scared of heights, actually. But I mean, of course, I've done this for so long that I have a very, very good control of what I'm doing when I pole vault. Now, if you pull me on like a ladder, at about the third step, I start getting scared. Uh, but I would say for pole vaulters, it's not so much the height that you get scared as the competition goes on. I think a lot of them uh, start getting worried and uh, insecure with uh, the poles, because as the competition goes on, you go on a little bit stiffer pole. Maybe some people go on longer poles, too, or they have to grip a little higher. So I think that's where the fear factor comes in a lot more than the height. But again, going back to the mental, I think we we, he, he has put me in a position throughout the year where I know what pole I need to be on, and even though I, I actually used a brand new pole the other day here, I knew I'm completely fine with it because I knew the one before was too small for what I was trying to do, and I was very confident going on and taking the jump right away. Um, so there is, the, I mean, of course, we know we, we're doing a dangerous event, but um, I think how we've set up the year and the years before, I think, make you less scared, if that's a good word. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Paul. I'm from Portugal. I'm a swimming coach. I'm not here for, by mistake. But I'm really curious about, you said, uh, you, your visualization training. I'd like to know if what you do, it, it's more the technique or, it's, or are you imagine beat your personal best, the national best or the world records? Both. Uh, oh, I mean, often I would just go through a competition scenario where I would start at a bar that I would normally, at a height I would normally start on, and then go to the next. And the problem is that I'm so bad at it, even still, that a lot of times I'm visualizing missing the bar, and then I'm like, no, I have to make it. And then I take a second attempt in my head, and I, I really am not pro the best visualizer. I'm working on it, but I mean, they come together. I think I'm trying to visualize the technique often, and. I would say more during the training season, I'm focusing on visualizing the technique. And once we get closer to meets, I'm just thinking that, OK, I made for 60, I made for 80, I'm, and then maybe to like a, a PR height, a personal best height. So both, yeah. Thank you. I think Katerina, in the beginning of the, this session, he said she is not watching now the other girls. Is it yeah. correct? Yes. But this point is very important. Because you don't need to watch competition, what they're doing. You came and you have all your program. 
strategy, mental preparation, and you don't need to see the world of others because this is picture can maybe destroy your picture which you have inside. This is very important point I just want also to share with you from my experience. It's regarding the mental preparation, this is, this is the key. You can have incredible talent, but if the person is not able to, to, to resist the, the stress, to resist the fear, you cannot do anything. Can be champion of champion, incredible results in the training, but when came to the competition, stress completely destroy, destroy the athletes. For that, it's, it's very important with, with your athletes, always teach them to be confident. They must remember best performance. They must re remember the, the, the best mental preparation in some competition, what they felt. They must be always confident. You must give support. If they shake it, this is put them for sure down. If it is even like big, big event world championships, when I see the athletes, I always say to them, but forget this is, doesn't matter. This is not world championship. This is championships of your city. <laughs> when you go in city championships, you're confident, you walk, open chest, you look to everyone. Like this doing the championships, because it's everyone afraid. Every opponent also in stress, everyone in the same condition. How you manage yourself, this is, will be the performance. And you came, this, who, who is your strongest opponent? Who is the strong opponent for her? Herself. Exactly, it's, it's right. For that, put your program, you know strategy and tactics. You know if everything's going well, you go this way. If something not, you need to be prepared. Regarding the put, like last attempt, if you're losing competition, I would br bring attention to this. If, like, I missed two attempts for five meter 90 in Tokyo World Championship. And the Hungarian Paul Volte did it in first attempt. No, he did in first attempt, I, I, I missed first one. I moved to last one for 595. Because what I explained before, because I have incredible motivation. 595, even if it's high, I go to win competition. This is totally different motivation. Now, sometimes, like if I look high jump, I see the uh, jumper who start to change. <laughs> They start to do something like from Paul Voltes. You cannot go 220, 225, 227, 229, 231. What if you're already 240? Why you waste so much energy? 20, 25, 30, 35, 240, finish. Because if you go so many walls, it's incredible how they resist, how they keep the energy. The bar is rising. You lose so much energy. You, you, you need also everything, it's mentally, prepare in advance. What you do, you need to look also environment, what weather condition, like we can see here in London. The weather in five minutes can be, will be completely different. <laughs> completely, but this is mental pressure. You must be ready for that. You must teach your athlete if weather change. You do this, you do that, you choose this pole. Take smaller pole or take stiffer pole. You, ch you change the tactic. You will not start maybe 450. You should start maybe 440 if you see clouds is coming and rain can start maybe. All these things, you need to teach athletes to be wise, smart, to, to be thinker. The athlete is not machine, it's human being, but it must be smart, intelligent. But this is coming from you on mental, on physical, and everything. What they do, they must understand. I think we agree this was a perfect technical summing up. Thanks a lot, Sergei, for, as an excellent moderator in that field of expertise, to sum up all our ideas. Gunther, I was not to prepare to be moderator. Just, uh, <laughs> please to, to share what I know and uh, try to be with this. Uh, we are great, privileged great to have you here. Today. Thank you. Give him a clap. And I ask our friend Victor to close the conference, please. Thank you, Gunter. 
I don't know. I, I'm so excited. I, I'm 74 years old. I'm still learning. I'm still putting this type of conference. We did one in South America last week, where the area, South America area, and the NACA area got together. We had our under 20 championship, and we took advantage that all our coaches from United States, Canada, Argentina, Uruguay, were there from America, and we had this type of uh, project. We started back in, in Berlin with this type of project. Now we have going a step forward, having the athletes that have been a medalist participating. And what Sajer uh, make the observation about, when we have this uh, gathering and the different projects that we have in the development uh, department, it's great to have coaches, personal coaches, with their young athlete together. Before we went to, uh, to the Junior Pan Am, uh, there was a, a project in Puerto Rico at the Regional Development Center where we have eight young pole vaulters from the Caribbean with their eight coach, personal coaches under one of Vitaly Petrov's best students, David Butler, who is a coach at Rice University in Houston, and he has a school of pole board there at Rice University with young kids all the way to a high performance level. And this type of uh, uh, project, uh, educational process, is, is, for me, is, is the best. We did it in the Caribbean back in the 90s, early 90s. Lauren Segre used to come with his athletes. We bring the best from the Carifta games with the uh, coaches, the best athletes, young coaches, young athletes and young coaches and everybody learned. Then they go back to their home and pass the knowledge to the other uh, coaches. And it's a fantastic uh, way of learning and exchanging experience and, and uh, knowledge. Uh, as president of the Coaches Commission, I want to first of all uh, introduce a couple of members of the commission that are here. They're very active, Oscar Gadea, who represents South America, and Charles Comenit, who represents Europe. It's right here, another great coach. This guy keeps me busy, and, uh, and we're missing Fran Dick, which is also a very active member of the commission. And I would like to recognize the development department, IWS development department. First of all, Gunter, who took the, the task of putting everything together, but we cannot forget Vicky, Vicky Brennan back there, Vicky. And Stefan, Tanya, where's Stefan? Stefan right there. Tanya, Alexia. Stand up, stand up. Without you guys, we, we couldn't do it. And the presenters and the athletes, the medalists, thank you from the bottom of our heart to be here. You now you could be partying and having a good time, and, and you're here sharing with us all your experience. And most important, to you, the coaches, you are the ones that we need to reward with this type of uh, activities, because you, many of you don't get paid. Probably 90% of you guys here are volunteer and do the work without paying. We are working on a project in the Coaches Commission to make our profession a profession, like engineers, like lawyers, and so forth. We're going to have a global association of coaches from athletics, where we will be putting together licensing. We've been registry, 
and hopefully we could send the message to government, government, minister of sports, uh, minister of education, that the coaches need to be paid like anyone else. Because a lot of you are non-pay coaches. So my admiration and respect to all of you. Thank you for coming to these four days. has been the best of all the, the conference that we have, global conference that we had. And uh, you will get all the biomechanical uh, data later on. And it's going to be posted also in the web page of the IAAF. And please keep doing what you're doing. You see that not one country or two countries getting all the medals now. They're coming from everywhere. They're coming from St. Kitt. They're coming from St. Lucia. They're coming from Trinidad and Tobago. They're coming from everywhere. They're coming from South Africa now. I used to tell my friends, uh, when that monster wake up, watch it, Africa, South Africa. And you can see they're leading right now in the medal count. So, because they're not only sprinter, uh, distant runners now and endurance, they have everything now, throwers and sprinters and so forth. But anyway, that's what we want as a sport, to be a global sport where we could be proud of it. Okay? Thank you very much, and best wishes for the rest of the, uh, the competition.